My name is Dr. Jodie Davis Thompson. I'm a researcher and a lecturer in the psychology department. And uh, today, basically, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a very small part of what you might cover in one of your modules um, and, and give you kind of an example lecture, right? So you can see a little bit of what it's like to learn at Swansea University. So I'm gonna be specifically talking about face recognition. So faces convey a wealth of information. So you see this picture of a child and well, that's the first thing, right? Is you see it's a child and you can tell that it's a child through certain features, right? If I was to ask you, how do you know it's a child? You'd probably actually quite struggle quite a lot um, to tell me what features in this face tells you that it's a child, right? But you're able to do it automatically. You're also able to pick up the fact that this child is probably very upset about something off the screen, right? So it's very automated, a very automated response. When you see two faces or when you see a face that you know that is familiar to you, you're often able to pick out the identity of that person. So hopefully you know who these two figures are. So this is the Queen and this is Theresa May, right? And they both share some really similar features, but you're able to tell one face from another quite easily. And you can do this despite um, the fact that often two faces will look really similar to each other. For example, these are both blonde haired, blue eyed guys, middle aged guys. For me, it's very important to tell these two people apart because one is my husband and one was my boss, right? So it's, it's quite important to be able to tell who's who. And you're also able to tell that two pictures from the same person over a long period of time are actually the same person, right? So this is both Paul McCartney down the bottom here. Um, so faces have got to be able to change in time and you still, be able to, you still have to be able to recognize them. So this seems to be a somewhat automated process that pretty much everybody can do with, with, uh, with ease. Okay, so I'm gonna go through some cool things to do with faces. All right, just before I go on to faces though, I'm gonna explain um, what I mean by I can change what you see. So what's going to happen is something's gonna, a picture's gonna come up on the, on the screen, a funny, funny colored picture on the screen. And there's a dot in the middle and I want you to stare at that dot. So don't move your eyes. It's really important that you don't move your eyes. So that picture's gonna stay up on the screen for a certain number of seconds and then uh, you stare at the dot and then the picture is going to change. And when the picture changes, I want you to keep your eyes on that dot. OK, here we go. So stare at that dot in the middle, at that black dot. Just carry on staring at it. OK. Getting there, you're halfway there. So just carry on looking. OK, so in a moment, the picture is going to change and it's very important you keep your eyes on that dot. Okay, so now you probably see it in color, right? But have a look around the image now, right? So when, you look, when you're looking at that dot, it's probably gonna play again in a minute. So when you're looking at that dot, what's happening is all, you see blue in your periphery, right? The color of the buildings. And so um, what, what's happening here is that your the cells in your eyes are firing and they're saying blue, 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 blue. And then when it changes, when it, ch it changes to black and white, so you can see that I'm not tricking you, changes to a black and white image, you see the opposite color of, of what it is that you saw. And the reason for that is to do with something called adaptation. So what happens is, is you've got cells in your eyes that care about whether something is blue or yellow. And so what happens is you see blue, and so your blue cells in your eyes start firing and they go blue, 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 blue. But your brain, cares more about changes to things. It doesn't care about things staying the same. Your vision is always looking for things that change in your periphery and in your central vision. So after a while, what happens is it goes blue, 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 blue. So the blue is um, the opposite to yellow in your eyes. So now the yellow is actually at baseline and it's now higher than the blue. So when you look at a black and white image, you now see the opposite color, which is yellow. Now that's happening for lots of different colors and that's happening at the level of the eye. But actually the same thing can happen at the levels of the brain. So now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show you a picture of a face 
And I'm going to show it on the screen for a few seconds. And I want you just to look at that face. Just carry on staring at that face that I show you on the screen. And then what's going to happen is the face is going to flash up very, very quickly. OK, all right, here we go. So stare at this lovely picture of Matt Damon. Carry on staring at him. And in a moment, a face is going to flash up. OK, so which face did you see? Well, so normally what I'd do is I'd ask people to put their hands up as to whether it was Ben Affleck or Matt Damon, but obviously you can't do that. Probably you saw Ben Affleck, right? Now, the reason is, some of you will probably have seen Matt Damon, but the most of you, the majority of you would have seen Ben Affleck. And the reason is because you adapted to Matt Damon. So your Matt Damon neurons, your, your neurons that care about everything in the face to do with Matt Damon started firing. And then they got this adaptation and they lowered their response. And so now you see the opposite face, which is Ben Affleck. However, actually, the face that I flashed up very briefly was a 50-50 morph of Matt Damon and Ben Affleck. So half of you should have seen Ben Affleck, half you Matt Damon. But that's not the case. Most of you would have actually seen Ben Affleck, the opposite face to the one that you adapted to. So that just goes to show that what, what you see or what you think you see isn't always actually what is there in front of you. And you can tell this with lots of different illusions and we cover illusions in classes, um, like how, how illusions work and what that tells us about the brain. So we cover that in the first year of psychology. Okay, another thing is, is that you're an expert at recognizing faces, right? So when I showed you Matt Damon and Ben Affleck, I'm assuming that most of you know who they are and you would have been able to tell quite quickly that that's who they were. Hopefully you can tell that this is Leonardo DiCaprio. Um, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show you an array of faces and your task is to say, you don't have to type it. I'll just leave you guys to do this on your own. I want you to have a think and say, which picture is the other version of Leonardo DiCaprio? Okay, so which one is Leonardo DiCaprio? You don't need to type, just have a think. Okay, so hopefully most of you have said it's number three, right? So number three is Leonardo DiCaprio. And you probably did this with relative ease, right? And you could probably also identify the other pictures and who these people are, right? So you're, you're an expert at recognizing faces. You're able to do this really quickly and really automated. You don't even think about it. It's just, it's just something your brain can do. However, actually you are really bad with unfamiliar faces. So generally we're really good at familiar face recognition, but unfamiliar faces is actually very difficult. So now I'm gonna do the same thing again. I'm gonna show the faces and I want you to tell me which is the other picture of this person. Okay, so have a look, have a think. Okay, so the answer is number five. Um, well done for anybody who got that. But what you probably found this time is that you had to go through very carefully and kind of start picking apart bit by bit. Oh, it looks a little bit like that guy, but it's not quite this guy. Oh, maybe it's this number, maybe it's number five, right? So you probably had to try a lot harder with unfamiliar faces than you did with familiar faces. And this is actually very important in psychology and in the world in general, because when people commit crimes, it's not normally Matt Damon that commits the crime against you, right? It's not normally a familiar person. If somebody mugs you, takes your wallet and, and your phone, then that's probably an unfamiliar face. And so you, um, this has a lot of implications for the police uh, and the fact that actually, people don't make, generally make very good eyewitnesses. Um, people are actually very poor at picking out people in lineups. And actually what I've done here is I've given you really simple images, right? They're neutral faces and expression, they're front on. Whereas normally an assailant wouldn't come at you with a nice neutral front on face for you to try and remember it later. They're normally pulling facial expressions, the lighting is varied, et cetera, et cetera. So familiar face recognition, it, there's a lot of research in this area, partly because of the implications this has for the police and in forensic psychology. Okay, so another aspect of faces is that some parts of the face are more important than others when it comes to face recognition. 
So when you see a face, as I said, it's somewhat automatic. Um, but actually, if I showed you these two pictures, you'll probably get the internal features. You'll probably find this one easier than this one, right? So you probably have got know who this is. You might have a rough idea who this is, but I'll show you in a moment. So the internal features are more important than the external features. And then if I was to show you just the top half of the face or just the bottom half, you probably find it easier to tell whose face this is from the top half and probably struggle at the bottom half. And then the eyes are more important. So you'll probably be able to tell who this is, even though I've covered up the same amount between the eyes and the mouth. So covering up somebody's mouth doesn't necessarily um, make it difficult still to tell who somebody is, but covering up the eyes makes it a little bit trickier. And there are your answers for those who, uh, who are curious. Okay. So that just goes to show that some parts of the face are more important than others. And of course, we're, work, we're working around a day and age where we're covering up our nose and our mouths, um, but we can still recognize the people that we know from their eyes, right? Peeking over the top of their masks. So another thing is that faces are harder to recognize upside down. Um, you might guess who this is. It's actually Ashton Kutcher, right? So um, whereas like if I showed you the upright face first, you'd instantly know. Whereas with an upside down face, it just takes that extra little bit of timings and like, oh, is it him? Is it not him? So it just, get, it just takes that extra bit of work from your brain to tell who it is. And the reason is because brains are pro um, because brains process up, upside down faces differently to upright faces. So hopefully you all know who this is. Okay, I'll give you a second. But the question is, have you noticed anything funny about it? Well, some of you might have come across this illusion before, uh, if you're studying psychology at A-level. This is called the Thatcher illusion. So this picture of, um, this picture of Obama is, uh, the eyes and the mouth have been flipped upside down on the upside down face. And so this is what it looks like the right way up. But actually the upside down picture of Obama doesn't actually look particularly grotesque. But when we flip it the right way up, that's, that, that's where you start to see that things are a little bit different and a bit strange. And that's because when you see a face upright, you process it holistically. And what I mean by that is you don't look at somebody's left eye, then right eye, then nose, the mouth to tell who they are. You take the face as a whole, right? And so when, it's, when you turn a face upside down, it actually disrupts that process. So turning a face upside down means that people have to rely on individual features like the eyes, the nose and the mouth. And so by turning a face upside down, you're disrupting the holistic process, holistic face processing, when you see it as a whole, and you instead do it by a piecemeal process. Okay, and another um, thing which I find really interesting and is in my area of research, is that some people struggle with faces. And this is called prosopagnosia, or it translates as face blindness. So individuals who are face blind, some people don't see the picture of a man, a man in this figure, they'll just see parts of, um, parts of the fruit and vegetables that make up this picture. But some prosopagnosics can see a face, right? So not everybody's the same, some can, some can't. So you can have a, a certain form of prosopagnosia where you just see the small pieces and you don't see the face as a whole. And you can also have a form of prosopagnosia where they still see it's a face, but they're not able to identify it. So this is an area where, which I'm really interested in because these individuals with prosopagnosia, they don't recognize their friends, their families, themselves, their kids, their partners, right? They're, they don't recognize these people. So you can imagine, for example, um, going to the supermarket with a family member, with one of your parents, for example, and then not being able to find them if you split up, right? I mean, it, it's actually a very upsetting um, situation for these individuals with prosopagnosia. And it's often very socially awkward as well, because when you meet somebody, you bump into somebody, individuals with prosopagnosia don't know who they've bumped into, even if it's their best friend, right? So that's an area of research that I'm really interested in. 
And if you chose face perception as a third year module, you'll hear more about, about this. And you'll also hear about it in passing um, in other modules also. Okay, so what I'm gonna do now is, um, this is a brick, a lovely, lovely brick. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna get you to remember this brick, learn this brick, okay? Okay, so now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show you another picture and I want you to tell me which brick it is. Right, well, it's a very, very difficult task, right? The task that I've given you is purposely a very difficult one, but this is an example that's been pulled off a, 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 um, a, a blog post from an individual with prosopagnosia to demonstrate what it's like to be prosopagnosic. So it was just a brick to you, right? All bricks pretty much look the same. It's hard to tell them apart. And that's what having prosopagnosia is like. It's like not being able to recognize the familiar face among a crowd of people. And so for those with the sharp eye, it's that brick down the bottom there. However, individuals with prosopagnosia can tell people based on certain features. They can identify based on certain features. So for example, um, you could have a unique feature in a brick, right? A little hole at the top right. Or you could have relationships. So um, you could be like, okay, the tall blonde haired woman always hangs around with the short brown haired guy, right? And so they can tell that when they see a tall blonde haired woman and a short, um, a short brown haired guy walking together, they can guess, oh, that's my friends, Bob and Daisy, right? Or they can do it based on location. So if there's a, a, a woman with long brown hair serving them coffee, oh, that's um, Fiona, right? So they can, they can do it based on the location where they see it. So now what you could do is you could pick one of these three unique feature relationships or locations. So I want you to pick one of these and I want you to remember it. So pick it, study it, remember it. Okay, so for the location one, it's near the bottom of the screen. That's all I'm telling you, it's gonna be near the bottom. Okay, now try and find your bricks. Okay, so have a bit of a look. See if you can find your unique feature brick or your relationship brick or your location brick. Okay, okay, now the answers. Right, they're the answers. So if I gave you a bit more time, you probably would have found them eventually. But you can, you can do this task, right? So it becomes easier if you look for something specific in a face. Um, and that's what it's like to be prosopagnosic. And so about 2% of the population are thought to be pros have prosopagnosia. So there's a good chance that one of you in this group probably has developmental, a developmental form of face blindness, but you're not necessarily aware of it. So it's actually a lot more common than people think it is. So one of the questions we can ask is, is it possible to teach people to recognize faces, right? And um, the way that we can do this is we can do it with training paradigms. So there's an area in the brain um, called the fused form face area. And some of you might have heard of this before. So if you turn the brain upside down and you're looking at the bottom, that's, in, that's called inferior temporal cortex. And the area just in the middle of the inferior temporal cortex in the right hemisphere, so just to confuse you, left is on the right, right is on the left. In the right hemisphere, we've got the fusiform face area. And this area is responsible for recognizing faces. So if we damage this area, like in this patient here, so this is a brain scan of a patient with damage to inferior, right inferior temporal cortex, and you can see it's roughly in the same place as where this fusiform face area would be. So if you damage this area like this patient has, you can end up with an acquired form of prosopagnosia. So that's face blindness caused by brain damage. And so, um, what we can do is we can ask, well, if we get these individuals with brain damage, can we reteach them, even though they're lacking this part of the brain, can we reteach them to recognize faces again? And this is a very, very important question because these individuals have had an absolute shock of their lives not being able to, they wake up from surgery 
or wake up from an injury and they can't recognize their friends, their families or themselves. And um, so being able to find this out, this is a very gruesome picture of a brain that's been in a car crash. Um, what we, what we can, what, it's, it's very important to find this out because it can benefit individuals who have um, certain patterns of brain damage to see if we can reteach them how to recognize faces. It also benefits border control agencies. So individuals who work in the border, uh, border control, they have to be able to recognize and be able to match the person in front of them with the passport photo in front of them. So obviously we want them to be really good at that task. So can we come up with a training paradigm that would also help border control agencies train their officers? And then also it has wider implications for um, security measures, um, not just in the UK, but around the world. Um, individuals who work at identifying people based on CCTV images, um, identifying criminals or terrorists, for example, um, from CCT images. So these are very grainy images, right? And you normally don't get really nice, clear images of neutral front on faces. They're normally very grainy. And so it would benefit individuals who work in this area as well. So quite a few people that benefit. And another group of people, which I mentioned before, individuals with developmental form of prosopagnosia, so people who are born with the condition who don't necessarily know that they have it. So what our training program um, involves is you present three faces on the screen and the task is to say which of the two faces most resembles the top face. Now, hopefully you can all do this task. The answer is the left face. If you can't do this task, then drop me a message because you're probably prosopagnosic. <laughs> um, so this, this should be relatively straightforward, right? So you should be able to tell this left face most resembles the top. But then what we can do is we can start to make the task a bit harder. So now, again, which face most resembles the top? Hopefully you can guess that it's this face. Now an even harder task. Now which one most resembles the top? Well, actually, I can't remember the answer to this because <laughs> I put this together a while ago, but I can't remember the answer. And that's because it's a very hard task because actually what I've done here is I've morphed the two faces together. And one of them is more similar to this top face than the other. And so what we can do is we can train people to actually be able to do this task. We can train people up to be able to do this task. And so, okay, what did we find? Well, the individuals with brain damage, we found that they improved 22% um, of the faces that they've learned. And new, in terms of new faces, they improved about 13%. So we showed them some faces which they had never seen before, and we asked them to tell them apart, and they actually showed an improvement of 13% uh, and 22% of the faces that they've learned. So we've, we're seeing some improvement on this training program. But, you know, what, ha what changes happen in the brain? Well, you know, it's all well and good. Um, seeing improvements in individuals. And that is indeed the end goal. You want people to improve in face recognition. But what, what's actually going on in the brain? Well, actually we can get people into the scanner, into the MRI scanner, and we can look before and after the training, they've done the training program, and we can see what changes are happening in the brain. Um, where, so I'm not gonna go into that now, but basically, um, we, we did this in a, bunch of, in a bunch of individuals with prosopagnosia, and we did find some changes, specifically that some areas of the brain seem to be talking more to other areas uh, of the brain. So just to summarize, faces are cool, right? There's lots of really cool things about faces. Hopefully you've learned a few things to, today, um, and now you can go away being face experts. And uh, we can train somebody to be better at tasks after after brain damage so even if you've damaged the area of the brain that is involved in fa face recognition you can actually improve and that what that suggests is that other areas of the brain are taking over this task which is amazing news for neuroplasticity right this idea that actually the brain has this amazing capacity to change um, and adapt to the situation okay and uh, just to um, go back to that dress 
Um, I believe that uh, somebody actually, uh, a Lodi actually got it right. It does depend on the lighting. So some people see this as white gold and some people see the dress as blue, um, uh, blue and gold, sorry, or what, blue and black and blue, sorry. Some people see it as black and blue and some people see it as white and gold. Um, the answer is indeed to do with the lighting. So if you have this dress in front of you in a shop, you'd be able to tell um, what its true color is. I don't know what the true color is. There isn't actually an answer, but um, you'll be able to tell really what color it, it is. And the reason you can't tell from a photograph, this photograph is because you don't know where the lighting is coming from. So if you make the assumption that the lighting is coming from above, you'll say it's one color. But if you make the assumption that the light is coming from behind, you'll say it's another color. And so some people, so all, all that's happening is that some people are assuming the light's coming from behind, other people are assuming the light's coming from above, and that's what gives you the perception of uh, the different colours in the dress. Okay, thank you very much.